Welcome to this week's lecture on political culture and identity. When we talk about political ideology broadly, what we are talking about are the answers to certain questions. And we can think about those in three categories. The first are questions about governmental legitimacy. What government does is based on the power that it has. So we have to think about questions about where power comes from, the people, or God, or a king, um, and authority, who has the ability ultimately at the end of the day to make certain types of decisions. So that's one set of questions. Another set of questions talks about governmental functions and powers, right? Where does power start from, but also what is the role of government in effectuating certain things? What is the role of government, um, for example, in a public health crisis? Um, what can they do and what cannot they do? And then finally, questions about money and property ownership. Ultimately, a government has to regulate money and property ownership between private individuals. And usually governments are given power to do so. That power, both the type of power given and the amount of power given, is a question that every individual has a different answer to. When we think about our personal ideology, we can think about the answers to these varying questions as components of it. So I want you to think about these as questions of our larger ideology. The way we view ideology today tends to be on this left-right spectrum. Um, left spectrum and being liberal or even Democrat, although that's a party title, we tend to associate it there. Right wing being conservative Republican, and then everybody else kind of falling in the middle. But we tend to view ideology very simplistically when it's a little more complex. We don't necessarily choose our ideology. We may think we do, but our ideology is comprised not just of our own general choices about how we believe, but about how our family life shaped us growing up, what types of work experiences we've had. Certainly our education level influences our ideology. And we don't always recognize it as ideology. Sometimes we recognize it as right and wrong. Sometimes we recognize it as um, things that people ought to do or ought not to do. And that doesn't mean it's always consistent across policy areas. People might believe in personal responsibility when it comes to um, your, your own finances, but maybe not when it comes to the education of your children. Maybe that should be governed more by the state. So there are consistencies and inconsistencies that we'll talk about, um, both in the readings and as we move forward here, that shape what American political culture looks like, because it's not consistent across the board. We can point to, if we think about that spectrum, right, we can point to places on that spectrum where things seem more inconsistent with the next opinion than uh, not, and then less consistent as well. So let me try something with you. When we think about someone who is a liberal, maybe you think about someone like Bernie Sanders. But is Bernie Sanders the same as Barack Obama? I think most of us would say that there is a difference. What that difference is does not differentiate kind of where we put them on that broader spectrum um, in terms of their relationship to maybe conservatives, but they are different from each other. Likewise, on the right side of the spectrum, Trump, Donald Trump, President Trump, and Senator John McCain or the late Senator John McCain. Both have been labeled conservatives, and I think both would label themselves as conservatives, but are they the same or are they different? This is what questions of political ideology bring up for us. So American ideology generally, when we think about political culture generally, that spectrum doesn't come kind of just out of the clear blue sky. It comes from this tension between two important strains of political thought in our history. And we're going to talk about those the next couple of weeks as we move forward with discussing the founding and civil rights and liberties. 
The first is classical liberalism, which, as we'll talk about, believes in personal um, liberties, individual freedoms. The other is this idea of republicanism. And when you think of that, I don't want you to think about the Republican Party. I want you to think about what it means to engage in a republic, to have engaged citizens who elect representatives who then believe that those representatives will go on and do the best job for them representing their interests. The struggle between these ideas is, is the struggle is real, as they say, right? And it's hard to imagine a situation more perfectly fitting for this than our current one uh, of COVID-19. We should, we generally as a society believe that people should have the freedom to move about as they wish, right? But we recognize in certain circumstances that we have a responsibility to others and that the state might need to step in to regulate that responsibility to others. Perfect example of the tension between liberalism and republicanism, where personal freedoms are at odds directly with kind of a, a concept of the greater good, right? This struggle is, is, is quite old. Um, it started after the revolution when we tried to set up a government, as we'll talk about next week, and is still around today. We see it in different ways, but classical liberalism is our dominant strain, and we it's one we kind of return back to time after time. And one of the readings you have this week is by a man named John Locke. And what Locke um, talks about, and this is pre-United States, this is pre-revolution, he's writing in uh, feudal England. And he's talking about how society is the product of individuals and that the highest good that a society can provide is individual liberty to do as one pleases. In particular, highest liberty to earn as one pleases by actually owning property. So Locke talks about the fact that we move from a state of nature into something where we do have to have a limited government um, that protects our property rights and settles disputes between private property owners. In this way, government is a means to an end. It is not in and of itself something that's great. If you are John Locke in the 1500s, this is the kind of thing that gets you chased out of England and uh, put on the run because you're challenging ultimately the king's authority, which he believes is granted to him by God and through a divine right where all kings traced their lineage all the way back to Adam to try and show that they have some, uh, special, um, some special meaning and some special right over other men on the earth. John Locke is saying that's kind of all foolish. Instead, we all own the earth in common, and we can only say we own property if we put our own labor into it. So the part that you are reading of John Locke talks about how we can put our own labor into property and make it our own, and that we shouldn't spoil things. We shouldn't own too much where it goes to waste, but we should own just enough where um, those things that we create through our own labor, you know, if we tend to a cherry tree and make a small orchard, um, and doesn't go to waste, that should be our own. Money comes in because, first of all, not everything is on the same season. Second of all, not everything grows the same way in all places. And third, the natural talents of man tend to be different from person to person. So if I'm a cherry farmer, I might want to trade with someone who has milk um, or who has wheat, and that is why we create money. Locke is what we call a social contract theorist. He has an idea about how government and the people enter into a contract where they say, he, here are the rights each other has. Ultimately, the power, he says, rests with the people, which, you know, a king doesn't like. Um, and the power that is given over to the government can only be valid when it is executed for the betterment of people and in Locke's case, he says, this is for the protection of individual rights. Some of this should sound familiar because we have that line from Locke that says life, liberty, and the pursuit of property, which Thomas Jefferson will later plagiarize in our Declaration of Independence. 
On the other hand, we have republicanism. And republicanism has its roots in ancient Greece, where we talk about things like Plato and Aristotle offering up governmental systems where there are people that we send um, to represent our interests at larger bodies, that we might not be the the in the best situation if we have pure democracy where everybody votes on everything. But if we choose the people who have our best interests at heart um, and we hold them to a higher standard than maybe the average citizen, that we can come up with something that is called the common good or the general will. Um, and what we see that come out in is our constitution. The libertarian side, or the the civil, uh, or the classical liberalism side, is very much the rhetoric of the revolution. Republicanism is very much the rhetoric of the Constitution. So, as we talk about forming governmental structures, this republicanism will be very important here because what we are talking about is how do we select people that will be the best representatives of the rest of us. And how do we set up institutions so that the best comes out of those? So this right-left dichotomy is what we're left with in a current setting. And I bet many of you have not explored this dichotomy um, or this spectrum in yourself. And so that is what we are going to do with iCitizen1. For iCitizen1, you will take two assessments of your own political ideology. They will ask you different types of questions about what you believe, some of which you may not have thought of before, um, and you may not have a strong opinion on it, and some others you may have a very strong opinion. They are two very different um, quizzes. The Pew Political Typology Quiz has you select between two uh, statements that are in direct opposition to one another, and you have to pick the one that's closest to what you believe. There's no in-between. The political compass has a lot of shades of gray, but they ask you questions in different ways that um, get at kind of these nuances um, a little bit differently than the Pew political typology quiz. For our understanding of political culture and political ideology, I think it's important that you guys examine your own ideology. What is it that makes you tick? Where do you fall on this political typology that Pew has outlined? And where do you fall on the political compass assessment? Now, a few things about this. Um, there, They will give you, with your results, how other people around you fall. I want you to take a look at that. In particular, with the Pew political typology, it will tell you how other people answered the questions in the quiz that are most like you in your results. For the political compass, it will tell you how um, others like you typically think, but also you can click on the side and look at how presidential candidates from this election and, and past elections actually align with your political views. You can also print, there's a way to print a PDF certificate that will show you where you align with different historical figures. These things are important because in iCitizen 1, what I am asking of you is to think about how you relate to others and whether this idea of freedom, uh, individual liberties, or and or Republican values where we elect people to try and create a system of greater good, whether those things all influence you and how. I want you to think about your influences, I want you to think about your, your experiences, and also your results in that uh, in these quizzes. So that's for iCitizen1, and that's all for political ideology and culture for right now. Um, make sure you do the readings on this. There is the lock reading, which is extremely important to understand this, and um, I think that you will find that the readings some of them are harder than others. Locke is certainly older English than we are accustomed to. So take your time with it. If you have questions, certainly let me know. Um, and if, if you feel like maybe you just want to drop into office hours and ask, the link will be up and available. Talk soon.